So does that work for you? Yeah, it looks great. So you just came back from Europe, right? I did. I've just been in uh, France for about a month, the whole month of uh, March. Actually, I went toward the end of February and came back to April the 1st. So it's just a month and a few days. So, so how do you gauge what's going on these days in, in the world? It seems uh, pretty intense in every way. <laughs> yeah, it does. Well, if I look at it in a really big picture, what I'd say is that um, the you know let's we, let's make a very simple uh, set of metaphors and you know into the the good versus evil, and then we won't have to pick on anything in particular. And uh, I think that we are getting to a point where the positive side, you know, good, has a chance of uh, not only uh, persevering, but actually turning things around rather dramatically. And I think that's um, possible. I don't know that that's a fact, but that's possible now in the near future. Near future being next, you know, couple of decades, perhaps. And as it usually does, the negative side tends to try to puff up and roar and give it its best shot, you know, uh, uh, just to hope to turn it around, right. to help to defeat that. But typically it's a, it's just a, uh, what are they, they call it, you know, the last hurrah. It's kind of the, the last big show of force before it crumbles. So negativity has that kind of a, that's kind of their MO, you know, they tend to do a lot of bluffing and puffing up and, you know, make a lot of noise and try to look as scary as possible. So a lot of it is, is the paper tiger kind of things that they do. So I'm thinking perhaps the, the stress that we're seeing all over the place right now is kind of the last hurrah of the, of the uh, negative side as we move into a new era where the potential for the good to, to, uh, to really grow and change in a very meaningful way into something a lot more friendly, a lot kinder and gentler and you know better for all of us to live with. So I think we're just in that last ditch effort of the negative to try to stop it. And on the other hand, I think that uh, when we get these spurts of negativity, it does something very positive for a lot of people. It makes us see what we don't want. Right. It makes it really clear, you know, what the problem is. It, uh, when otherwise, if you go back uh, 20 or 30 years and people were saying, well, you know, this is just not sustainable and there's going to be problems and we're going to have all these troubles and everybody goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's going to be bad. Go away. We don't need your bad news, you know, your constant uh, telling us about how awful things are. Well, now it's kind of obvious, you know, where it's, you know, where it's all leading and where, if it doesn't turn around, where it's going to end up in another decade. You know, we've been uh, slip sliding away toward more authoritarian, more fascist kind of thinking, not only uh, in this country, but in the world. And that, again, I think is a big push on the negative side to uh, see if it can't uh, cut us off at the pass. So, as far as, uh, yeah, so I, I don't see it as a problem. I see it as just the way it is. And we, we will, um, you know, we, we deal, stuff happens and we get to deal with it. You know, that's my way of looking at reality and, and how it is. And maybe it's not time for us to make big changes. Maybe we'll just be part of the evolution that leads to that later, but that's okay. So I'm going to do my part and do the best I can no matter what the situation or conditions are. And if it's time, then it's time. If not, then I'm just part of the evolutionary process. So either way, it doesn't make any difference as far as what I do and how I see myself and how I see my mission and, right. and what I'm trying to do in the world makes no difference. I just do that the best I can and stuff will happen however it happens. And that's the way it is. Well, we is a funny term because we is, there's many we's here, isn't there? There's, there's we, the masses, that really doesn't pay much attention to anything. It just reacts to what's going on in a very mm -hmm. uh, light kind of way. What, whoever hits them is when they react. Mm -hmm. There's a we that 
that I would say that you're a part of, a we that is of, of consciously being aware of what's going and consciously trying to direct an intention. If the mass we, uh, the mass we seems to always have these cycles, doesn't it? Where things get bad, they, they react to the bad with the good. They just follow this wave, this, this sine wave, don't they? Of, of up and down, up and down. And I, and I imagine you're trying to talk to that we that's in that, the middle of that sine wave, trying to get it to be a little more um, consistent or uh, conscious. I am, but I'm talking to the whole thing too. I'm trying to, you know, the whole, the masses have, you know, those, there's power in numbers, of course. And the masses are going to determine what the nature of our society and our culture and our quality is. The masses will do that. Uh, right now, what we have is a good, accurate reflection of the quality of consciousness of the masses. Right. You know, we're seeing who and what we are. It's, we're living it. So we have to change the quality of consciousness in a big way in the masses, not just in the margins, not just among the, you know, the choir that, uh, you know, agree with us. We have to make these changes down to the, to the everyday level. Right. And otherwise, we're not going to accomplish anything other than we can pat ourselves on the back for a job well done. And we will have a kind of a side group in the margins of society that has a bigger picture but it's not gonna change anything in a big way unless we get this down to the everyday man kind of level that, you know, we the masses, we, we humanity have to get it and grow up. And right now we humanity are being squeezed. We're getting a very good object lesson on what it is we don't want and where it is we don't want to go. And as that sinks in, it may, the timing may be just perfect to where if we offer them something different at this point, they're ready to reach out and grasp something different at this point where 30 or 40 years ago, nobody was ready to reach out and grasp anything different. So often the evil side, the bad side plays to the good side's benefit in the sense that, uh, you know, we may get this, this yearning for something more sane, something more equitable, something more sustainable. It may peak up just about the time something better and you know, more equal and more sustainable appears on the horizon, and that would be very fortuitous. So you never know. You see, it's not that the that the bad things are just so bad that if they could just all suddenly stop, it would be a wonderful thing. Maybe you got to see it as all part of a bigger play, bigger thing going on. And it may turn out that the, this last hurrah of the negative forces in our society is this exactly what we need to set up the end game for really making a big move to the, to the love side, to the good side. So I don't see things in a negative light. You know, yes, there's a lot of stuff going on that's pretty ugly and it looks like it's just gonna get uglier and it looks like the, the bad guys are in the seat of power for the most part. And it looks like that uh, there's not a whole lot that we the little people can do about it. And all of that looks very, kind of frightening and bad news and so on, but I don't see it that way. I think it's all part of a bigger thing and it is whatever it is. We do the best we can with what we do and then, you know, stuff happens and that's the way it is. So win, lose or draw, we keep on chugging, trying to do what we think is right. And maybe it'll work this time or, you know, this time, I mean, in the next decade or two, or maybe it won't work for a century, but that's all right. Even if it doesn't work for a century, or two centuries or a millennia will be part of that evolution of these better ideas that'll be necessary and will be accepted sometime because sooner or later we will end up a happier, more equitable, more sustainable uh, uh, society of we the people who care about each other. We will get there one day. I am convinced of that because it's just, it's on the path of our evolution. It's where we will go. Evolution is slow, but it is also relentless. And it's that relentless, relentlessness of, of evolution that lets me know that we will get there one day. We will have a kinder, gentler, more caring, more loving society and humanity than we have now. But just when that happens, will it be in two decades? It's possible. Will it be in two millennia? Well, that's possible too. 
I'd kind of hope that it's going to be sooner, but I don't, uh, you know, I'm not investing any money in that. It's just going to be whatever it is, and that's okay. I do whatever I do. You're doing whatever you're doing, right. and we just keep on doing it because that's, that's what we need to do at this time. And so it has always been, I guess, with people like us and trying to make big changes. And most of the time, the big changes don't happen. But we're growing on the things that everybody else has done before us. And, uh, you know, it all does add up eventually. And I believe that now is different than any other time in history. Now we are more able to make a big step forward than we ever have been before. So that's, that's uh, you know, that's the good news. So, so you were saying, though, in one of your things, that, that, that consciousness requires pressure in order to evolve. It does. It requires choices. And the choices have to have consequences. And the consequences have to be meaningful, significant consequences. Otherwise, there's very little incentive to grow up, to change, to change yourself, which is what's required. And if everything is just fine the way it is, well, there's not a whole lot of effort in, you know, becoming more. So yes, that's pressure is just, we have to have choices with consequences. So then a future of, of peace mm -hmm. and love as the, as the basis for, for, mm -hmm. for consciousness, where does the pressure come from then? Oh, well, the pressure then is, uh, well, let's, it comes from the uh, need to maintain it. It's not easily maintained. You see, uh, I, I think of this in terms of entropy, which tends to make it a little easier to, to talk about. Entropy is a measure of disorder. Okay, so we're talking about taking our social system and having less disorder in it. You know, we're having, talking about it being more cooperative, more caring. So there's more, more order, it's more constructive. Um, everybody has the maximum amount of free will to do just whatever they want in the way they want to. So it's a, it's a big plus up for free will choice. But any system, let alone the entropy increases. Second law of thermodynamics, it just grows. Okay, so you don't do maintenance on your house, eventually your house will leak and cave in. It, everything requires energy to, you know, input to keep it from going backwards, to keep it from decaying and disappearing. So what happens when we have this society built on love is that it will require a lot of effort to keep it that way. Otherwise, entropy will creep back in. Um, you know, the negative side will start gaining power and the power will be abusive as power always is. And it will re, you know, it will de-evolve. So once you're evolved, it still takes a lot of of effort, a lot of caring, and a lot of, of uh, energy to keep it that way. It just doesn't stay that way. Whenever you relax and say, okay, this is great, you know, let's, let's not uh, you know, work on this anymore, that's when it starts de-evolving and going in the opposite direction. So I think that will be the lesson. And that will keep everybody busy because in order to optimize everybody's potential, that's not an easy thing to do. You know, there'll be a lot of things that uh, optimizing my potential may run over your potential. You see, well, there's a lot of things that need to be worked out, a lot of things that need to be adjusted, and, and it's going to be a constant effort to keep making those adjustments so that you can reach your potential and I can reach my potential. It should never be exclusive, yours or mine. It ought to always be yours and mine. And in a caring society, that will work but it doesn't come for free. You have to work at it. You have to care and you have to come up with ways of, of uh, making sure that everybody gets their fundamental needs met and that everybody contributes up to their level of potential. So is, is the energy that you're talking about that counteracts entropy, is that attention? Is that the energy we're talking about, attention? Like for example, as you mentioned in many times, the double slit experiment, experiment. It's a tension that, that changes a, a, a wave to a particle, is it not? Um, no, I think you're talking about intention, right? Not yes. attention. It's yeah. Well, in, yes. Yeah, okay. I mean, isn't attention just our manipulation of intention? Our, our... Yes, intention is, is what we 
Um, down at our core, this is the, the intention I'm talking about. Down at our core being, we have an intention. We have some purpose. We have some reason why we do things. And that's our intention. And that may be different than what we think in our intellect. Intellectually, we may think that there's you know, other reasons that we do it. Particularly if we have a lot of fear, ego, and belief, then our intentions, little I intentions, are going to be intellectual and they're going to reflect that fear and ego and belief. But the, the core intention down at the being level, okay, that's the capital I intention. And that's the thing that represents us. That's who we are. That's our quality. And yes, it's that intention at that level is what is the, that's the motive force within consciousness. That's the thing that can change things. Consciousness and is a, is a thing that, that can change its, its, um, its content. And that content changes based on our capital I intention, what's, what's in there, you know? So yes, that's the thing that makes the difference. So if we intend that we care, you know, if we care about others, that's our intention. Our intent is, I wanna help. I wanna be part of the solution. I wanna help you, uh, you know, optimize your potential. I want you know everybody to uh, to get a piece of the pie as best we can for all of us. You know what makes sense for everybody, and that's what why I want. That's my intention. And if everybody else has that intention too, well, it'll work wonderfully. So if there's some people over on the side that have the intention, well, that's not my intention. My intention is to get everything I can get. I want to accumulate all the stuff and all the power so that I'll be in charge. And that's my intention. You see, and there's going to be people like that because they do have fear and ego and beliefs. And well, that's going to exist. Well, you need to work with that. You know, you need to deal with that. It's not that everybody who disagrees with you, you take them out and shoot them. That's just more fascism. You have to work with that. And, uh, you know, hopefully there, that will get less and less of that. That will be a, that will be the, um, the, the kind of dysfunction in the margins, if you will, rather than, you know, the good side being, you know, the, the big picture being in the margins and the dysfunction being in the big population, it should be the other way around with the big population being full of love and caring and the dissatisfaction is going to be in the margins. So we'll have to work with that stuff in the margins, trying to uh, not punish it or contain it, but try to reclaim it. And, and by reclaiming it, do you mean that, True individuation, I imagine. True individuation would be the merging of attention and intention. Um, being, being that you're conscious of, of your, your core. It, it, what Don Juan or somebody like that would say that the, the combination of the three attentions, the, the alignment of, of all of our attentions. Would you say that, that, that individuation is the only way to, to have a mass consensus? Individuation, that means... Uh... All of us are independent, individuated units of consciousness, right. and we all have to interact as individuals. Right. Yes, that is the way it is. That's the way it needs to be. That's the, that is where our, our evolution is taking us. We're not going to meld into one big you know, thing. We're not going to, like our cells in our body, you know, they're all stuck shoulder to shoulder to each other you know, throughout the system. We're not like that. We have to deal on the level of, of awareness. Uh, level of consciousness, not on the physical level of, you know, bonding to each other and becoming one, one animal. We are going to create something, though, that is bigger and, and um, I don't know, bigger, more powerful, more exquisite, uh, more beautiful than any of us individual when we all work together as individuals. But we, yes, we have to maintain ourselves as individuals. That's, that's who and what we are. So we, we're not ever going to get in a situation where we become, um, you know, what is it, the merge, merge with the source, you know, you know, that we snuff out our individuality and just become part of a, another big monolithic thing. That's not where we're headed. We're always going to be individuated units of consciousness, and we're always going to have free will choices. And we can make good choices and we can make bad choices because that's what free will means. And we have to make those good choices because we want to make them. We, that's our, that's our intention to do those because that's the way we are. 
it's not out of action. In other words, it's not out of, uh, um, you know, we're not acting. It's a matter of being. It's not like we all have to act nice and act like we love each other. That won't work. We all have to be nice and really care about each other at the being level. And then it works just fine. And because everybody else cares about me, you see, everybody in this group, I care about all of them, but they all care about me. So when I say, hey, raise my hand, I'm not happy. I'm not, you know, I don't like doing what I'm doing. I think it's boring and it's wasting my potential. Everybody else wants to fix that for me because they, don't, they care about other. They care about, you know, the whole and they care about other people. So they say, well, how can we fix that? What's your problem? You know, what is it that you do need? And they will try to fix that for me. That's why it never gets to be the, you know, the tyranny of the majority. You know, that's, you know, when people talk about a, a um, collective, we have this, this gut uh, reaction to the collective as a, oh no, you know, that's the tyranny of the majority or the tyranny of whoever happens to be in charge, you know. That goes right back to fascism and, and dictatorship and everybody else is just a weenie person, a serf, you know, got their hands on a crank and their job is to turn that damn crank and that's it. And if you don't like it, well, you know, there's, there's a worse job that we could give you. You know, there's always a salt mine to work in. So that's, that's the, the kind of the knee-jerk reaction to the word collective in society. But that is exactly what happens in a collective that is fear-based. So if you have a fear-based collective that's full of fear and ego and belief, then that's what you get. You get a gulag. Yeah, but if you have a collective based on caring and love and cooperation, you don't get a gulag. You get everybody's free will optimized and maximized. Because if you're having a problem, everybody wants to help you solve it. And if you have plenty of resources, which resources are really not such a big problem, um, particularly as we get more and more robotics and other things, goodness, the, the, the uh, means of production are almost uh, you know going to work 24 hours a day for no food you know they're just going to just going to produce and produce so production is not really a problem as we get into the into the age of of uh, information and programming and computers and robots and that kind of thing the production is is not something like well let's take all this job to you know to the poor people somewhere you know where they can work for 50 cents an hour and uh, everybody else will, you know, live high on the hog based on their labor. It's not going to, it doesn't have to be like that. See, that's back in the old fear-based paradigm. And in a fear-based paradigm, that's exactly the way it is. But in a love-based paradigm, it's not like that at all. We say, oh, those people over there, they're poor. Well, how can we help them? How can we get them up to the same space we're in? What do they need? Education, different kinds of things, live someplace else, uh, different environment, cleaner water we'll solve the problems. So that's, it's just a different place. So a love-based collective is a wonderful place to live with maximum free will, maximum choice. And a fear-based collective is a terrible place to live. <laughs> it's where the people who are powerful, you know, beat up everybody else to, because they want everything. They want all the, they want all the marbles. They want the, to control everything. So there's a big difference there. So this word collective, I know, hits people very, very wrong, but that's because they're looking at it from a reflection of how we are now rather than how it is we need to become. And, and a community of individuated beings don't need a hierarchy. They wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be a necessary thing. Hierarchy is only necessary for people who do extend their, their power outwards as opposed yeah. to... Well, yeah, for the most part, the organizations in a, in a uh, love-based collective would be very flat. You know, it's not going to have lots of hierarchy in it, but you still have to have some structure. Mm -hmm. You have to have some, I mean, somebody has to pick up the garbage regularly. We just can't say, well, if anybody feels like it, you know, go pick up some garbage. That doesn't work. Things have to be organized. You need to have rules like you know, how often does the garbage have to be picked up? And those things have to be met. And, you know, there's work that needs to be done and it needs to be organized and it needs to be managed and the work has to be to a particular quality and do things the right way. 
So all, there has to be some, some uh, management, okay? That's, that's necessary, that there's management. But the management is just to help us all work together. We have to be coordinated. If there's seven and a half billion of us, you can't have everybody just running off doing whatever they want. You need to have some management that optimizes it for everybody. So we all know that garbage needs to be collected on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, and it has to be taken to a landfill or it has to be, you know, something else has to happen to it. We just don't throw it out our window because that then is a problem for other people. So we have this management that will, that will, um, you know, function, but it's a very flat sort of thing. It's not like level after level after level. It's just basic rules because everybody wants to cooperate. Everybody wants to do what makes the whole thing work better. Then it's not like you're going to have to enforce people to, you know, pick up, you know, pick up their garbage. People will want to do that because that's part of the contribution to the society. So, you know, you might be a, a brain surgeon on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and you may ride on the back of a garbage truck on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. That way you get some exercise, you feel healthier, you know, you get to contribute in some way. So everybody won't be in kind of roles like we have now, you know, brain surgeons only do brain surgery and they don't do this and they make $200,000 or $300,000 a year. And, you know, they're really well off and other people who collect garbage well, there's a lot of them to pick from, so they don't get paid very much. And, you know, they're, they work long hours. They have nasty work to do, but they don't get paid much for it. That's just the way it is. That's the strata that you get in a fear-based society. But in a love-based society, you don't have all that strata going on. There's just things to do and people wanting to cooperate. So let me use some of your concepts to build a, 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 a future, a different future with your concepts. Okay. Um, if 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 the the PMR is a virtual reality, um, that that means that the potential is anything a group of individuated awarenesses can imagine. Is yes. Right? Yeah. And, and once there's an agreement among those individuated awarenesses, uh, do you, would you say that things are instantaneously altered? the virtual reality is altered instantaneously? Or is it a, 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 a linear uh, plotting experience of having to, 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 to change things physically in this world with our hands? Do you know what I mean by that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, there will be a need to uh, deal with things physically. Things just won't instantly change because in other words, this, the reality, their virtual reality, okay, has a rule set. And the rule set is what defines the virtual reality. It's what it defines what can happen here and what can't happen here. Okay. So the rule set says I can flap my arms just as hard as I want to. And I still won't lift off the ground. I'm not going to fly because I'm too heavy. You know, my arms don't move enough air and so on. So the, the rule sets give us, give us uh, constraints of how we have to make changes. We can only make changes here within the rule set. So if the changes are one of attitude, well, that can happen very quickly. Because if you have a whole bunch of people that want to be part of the solution, and it becomes known that the best way to become part of the solution is that you separate your, uh, you know, separate your trash into the stuff that's to be destroyed and the stuff that's to be recycled. Okay, that's and thing. Well, then everybody will just do that because they'll say, yeah, I see that. That's, that'll make it better for, every, for all of us. So that can happen on a dime because that's in the world of thought and in consciousness. So overnight, you could have seven and a half billion people who change their mind on how they handle their waste. But if it comes to, it would be nice to all live in underground houses because that way we wouldn't get too hot in the summer and um, you know, we wouldn't need so much air conditioning and that would cut down on uh, you know, fuel and, and energy expenses and so on. And that's a big idea. Well, now it's going to take time. You just don't think that and poof, a bunch of houses all you know, go underground and uh, are engineered to be a very nice, pleasant, uh, lighted space, you know, underground. So that's a, that's a thing that uh, you'd have to spend years in the process of changing from what you've got now to what you've got then, you see. So 
And at that time you'd have, how do you make an underground house livable so that you see light and the sun comes up and the sun goes down and you have all of the stuff that, you know, you need, you can't just live in a dark hole. You know, it has to be something that is, uh, that is a happy place to be. So all of that then is, is study and analysis and, and research and then construction. And that will take, you know, that would take decades, if not more, to, you know, move a big part of the population from one kind of housing to another. So, yeah, it's not just automatic. It, we've got a rule set to deal with, and we still have to, to, to deal with that. So the rule set that you're referring to actually is very pliable, right? Because, I mean, uh, in a thousand years, maybe we will have wings or a million years. Right? In, other words, <laughs> in other words, uh, in the, in the it, eternal here and now, um, uh, everything is possible within the range of possibility. Is that correct? Well, yeah, that's, it's, it is that way, but maybe not to the extent that you're thinking. Um, the rule set has to be the rule set that allows this place to evolve to be what it is. Okay, now, by that, I guess I'll have to go back and say that, um, you know, this is a virtual reality, but this virtual reality is not programmed. If it were programmed, then you could just write a different program, right? And it'd just be different, but it's not programmed. This is evolved. So you take a, a set of initial conditions and a rule set and let it evolve. And eventually it evolves into our universe, which eventually has our solar system, which eventually has us. And now here we are talking, you know, over Zoom. So all of that's just evolved out of the rule set. Okay, now you can't just jerk that rule set around. That rule set's a very delicate balance of all sorts of things that keeps this reality stable. So the rule set isn't gonna change much, but we can evolve, right? We can evolve. So we could, if it were necessary, evolve wings or anything else. That's evolution. Evolution, uh, you know, mutations happen, right? And the mutations that are beneficial stay. The mutations that are not beneficial go away. So there's really no limit on the potential of what we could become because we can evolve into whatever it is that is most effective for us to be. And if that's wings, then we can evolve wings. If it's not, then we'll never evolve wings if that's never on our path to being more effective, more caring, more cooperative, uh, you know, more love. So that's, the, you know, that's the difference. Now, because the way this consciousness uh, virtual reality works, and this virtual reality is computed within consciousness. So I guess I need to say that you have a larger consciousness system. Part of that system is the computer that's computing this virtual reality. And part of that system is us. We individuated pieces of consciousness. Okay. And part of that system is like the operating system, the, the management, if you will, that's not very hierarchical, but needs to be there just the same. Okay. So you have that. Now, part of the way this works is that mind leads, body follows. Remember, body is a virtual body. So as consciousness evolves and changes, the body tends to change to allow consciousness to express what it is with that body. Okay, so that works in our, in our favor and sometimes against us. You know, people, um, let's say we look at the placebo effect. Placebo effect, people who in their minds have a real positive attitude toward their illness will heal, will, will uh, get well, better. That's the placebo effect. Those that have a real negative attitude toward their illness will more likely get worse. And it's not just they think they're getting worse or they think they're getting better. It really changes the state of their health. And that's the statistical process done with, you know, two groups. One that had this, you know, one that had a positive uh, attitude, one had a negative attitude, and one that didn't have any attitude, the control group. And they can see the statistical difference. And to a good statistical significance, it changes your health, what your attitude is. Well, that's just this idea about the mind leads and the body follows, you see. So um, we, can, we can evolve. We not only do we have evolution of our physical beings within the rule set, but our consciousness will help shape how that evolution takes place, depending on how we the consciousness evolve. So we're not just bodies in here kind of unique by ourselves. We have consciousness as our, as our, um, you know, that's our, that's our mind. That's our thinking part. The body is just ones and zeros. Okay. So I was going to ask you, do, do, do you not see that there's consciousness in the body itself? Uh, no, I wouldn't uh, say that there's consciousness in the body itself. 
Uh, I define consciousness as something, anything that has a finite decision space, okay, would be conscious. So let's say we have a, uh, you know, a, a dog or a cat or a raccoon. They obviously make decisions. They make choices. And they're not just hardwired. Hardwired means it's just, you know, it's, it's just the way your body's wired. You know, whenever you see this as a stimulus, you do that as a response. You don't have any choice in the matter. It's just the way you're hardwired. Okay, sometimes we call that instinct, but it's actually a little different than instinct. It's, it's a, a being that just is reactive rather than thoughtful. So one with choices can, has consciousness. Consciousness has to make choices. Now, that's just my definition. We can, we can broaden that and have a different definition of consciousness, but for my purposes, talking about consciousness, that's my definition. It has to have a, a zero, a, a finite, a non-zero, a finite decision space. That means choices, free will choices to make. So we can look at a sunflower and we can say, well, as the sun moves, that flower actually tracks the sun. You know, it looks at the sun. So it chooses to look at the sun. Now we find out that the, when the sun heats up this side of the stalk and the other side of the stalk's in the shade, then that puts a stress on a stalk and it just turns to follow the sun. So that would be algorithmic. That's not its choice. It's just what happens. It's hardwired that way. So now how far down the list of, of uh, critters do you go before you don't find consciousness anymore? Well, who knows? What about a, what about a worm? You know, can a, does a worm have choices? Well, maybe. I don't know. You know, it would take biologists probably a few years to figure out how to, how to you know, uh, make worms you know go through mazes or do other things to see whether or not they actually were making choices or whether they were just creating hardwired memory you know uh it's it's hard to say but uh, when you get the rocks and things like that individual cells in the body they're pretty much hardwired they do what they do you know they have they have a job to do and they do it whether they're making choices well i don't really want to absorb that you know, that oxygen molecule and that hemoglobin, I don't feel like that today. So they don't do it. Probably not so much. You know, the cells just do what they do. So I'd say they're algorithmic for the most part. And, and um, that does not equate to consciousness in my definition, the way I use it in my theory. Okay, so I want to say that I know other people have different ways of looking at it. But that's what I mean by consciousness is the thing that makes choices. Right. Well, what's interesting is that is that disi uh, not disciplines. Well, wait, I'll just use but disciplines that focus on body consciousness say there is no free will generally. And I guess it's because exactly why you say because they react to a moment, the, the moment in some ways. Right. Uh, they react to the 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 moment. And and I guess what you're saying is that things that react to the moment are not are not mind. Right. Th it's not really consciousness. They're not making choices. They're just following some algorithm, some stimulus, you know, and an effect of the stimulus uh, without without thought. Now, of course, we can do that too. You know, many of us go through life like zombies, where we just react to things and we're not really thinking much. But we have the choice. We could think. It's just many of us have, uh, you know don't really use the free will that we have very much. So we do go through our life like zombies, just reacting to things. That's not good, but it's, that's just another one of our choices. We've decided to give up that free will as a choice and that leaves us like that. But these things like, uh, you know, like the sunflower, you know, it's not really deciding, well, today I think I'll follow the sun. No, nah, I don't think I'm gonna do it tomorrow. I'm tired, you know, tomorrow I'm gonna to be just too tired and I'm not gonna follow the sun. Well, it doesn't work like that. If the sun goes by, the sunflowers all turn because they're, they're hardwired. And yes, that, that's, that's body consciousness is probably talking about like that sunflower, you know, it's just the stuff we do. The body knows what to do and when to do it. You know, you don't have to tell the body to attach oxygen to hemoglobin to run it, you know, through the, the blood system to the cells. It does that because that's what it does. Right. That's to me is not consciousness. That is evolution. Evolution has the things that work well, you know, continue. So things that can breathe and oxygenate all their cells continue and the things that can't fall over dead and they, they don't continue. So here we are, this amazing machine 
that really is a very complex machine that does amazing things, but it's all there because it evolved to be there because that's what works. And yes, over millions, millions, hundreds of millions, maybe years of evolution, uh, it seems like, wow, this body is so complex, so amazing, so totally intricate and connected and, you know, all these balances and things that are going on. It's just so, you know, obviously, uh, you know, somebody had to design that. Well, not necessarily. It's just evolved to be that way. And yes, if it went from nothing one day to this amazing thing the next day, that would be a miracle. But it didn't. It took a million years to do that by a lot of trial and error. So we look at it now after millions of years and we say, wow, that's totally amazing. But we have to realize it's been a long time, you know, through a lot of trial and a lot of error to get to this point. So in a scenario, for instance, you're riding your motorcycle. I don't know if you ride motorcycle anymore. Uh, not too much anymore. My, uh, my, uh, the one Pamela, yeah. she, uh, put a Nix on that motorcycle. <laughs> but, uh, she cares about my health and longevity so she put an X on that motorcycle but yeah I still fondly remember those days see there's two directions I want to go with what you just said I wanted to go where I was going and I wanted to go with the other so, <laughs> all right you know, let's do them both okay I have to remember so the what the first I want to go in is that in this scenario where you're riding a motorcycle and all of a sudden a, a rabbit runs across the road mm -hmm. your mind's busy thinking about where you're going to your meetings that you're about to have you're mm -hmm. only paying peripheral tension, but but all this, but your body immediately has a response to that and reacts. Um, for you, that's not a, con a conscious action, or uh, that's not consciousness, I should say. That's, that's, that's a, um, how would you describe what that moment is for you in your awareness? Well, um, that would be a, uh, a learned, a learned reaction. That's the way the body reacts, okay? It's just learned. It's not really thinking about it. It's just doing it. As a matter of fact, this, let's talk about nothing all that dramatic. Let's talk about athletes. You know, athletes who are good. If you're a really good athlete, you're the Olympic kind of athlete, then you will say that your success is 80% mental and about 20% physical because you don't think, okay, now do I have hold of this javelin right? Let's see. Okay. Do I have my hand? Yeah. My thumb's in the right spot. Now I'm going to twirl around. Okay. It's time now to do this and do that and put my feet. If you do that, you'll right. be the worst javelin thrower in the world. You know, you'll never throw a javelin. The way you do it is you practice, 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 practice to where your mind is disconnected from it. Right. All you are is being level intent. And at that being level intent, you just do it. Right. If you have to think about it, you'll never be very good at it. Right. That's you know? the zone. Yeah, that's the zone. That's same with typing, typing on a keyboard. You'll never do touch typing if you think about where your finger is and what key it's going to hit. It has to get to the point where you do it without thinking. So you're not really making choices. You've learned a pattern. You've set a pattern. Uh, like catching a ball. Some, you know, take a four-year-old and you toss a little four-year-old boy a ball he can't catch it. You know, he grabs at it, but he misses and it's really hard for him to catch it. Well, after he practices enough, he creates a, 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 a um, what do you say? He, he creates a simulation of hy hyperbolic trajectories in his mind to where he can automatically compute where that ball is going to be by the time he gets to where that ball is. So he can now run and grab a ball because he's got this, this uh, hyperbolic trajectory calculator that he's programmed inside his head. And he doesn't think about it, he just does it. So those are not choice making, those are things that we do with our mind that we can set, you know, we can learn those things and we will react to those depending on how much we practice them. If we don't practice them, we never get very good at them. But if we do practice them, we can get fantastically good at things, and I would not say that that is uh, a, a choice, a free will choice, but it required a free will to practice it. You so, see, so it, it only occurs because you've got free will in the sense, so you don't have things without free will doing that, but you, the free will creates the code, the, the um, what do we call it? Um, well, it creates, it creates the algorithms that makes that possible 
and to do it smoothly. So, so it takes free will to get there, yes, but the actually act itself of missing that rabbit is, uh, is a uh, algorithm. So the zone is not consciousness? The zone is not, well, now we're gonna split some hairs, okay. The zone is not intellect. Right. Okay, the zone is not intellect. If the intellect gets involved, you're lost. Right. If you have to do it without the intellect. Right. So it, once you can do it at a reactive level rather than at a thinking level, then it's consciousness, not directly, but indirectly, because the consciousness had to develop the algorithm in the first place. So it's still based on consciousness, but the consciousness now has set up an algorithmic response that'll just happen on its own without thinking. And actually, if we ever want to do anything really, really well physically, we have to get in that zone. You know, if you watch a painter painting and he doesn't mask, you know, if I paint on a windowsill or something, I put masking tape all over it because I'm a clumsy painter. And if I don't have masking tape, I'll paint the glass. But you take a professional painter and he dips the brush in the paint, he hardly looks at it and he goes up there and he makes a stroke and it's perfect perfect right up to the edge of the glass to the nearest hundredth of a millimeter and not a drop on the glass anywhere and he can do that all day long but he's not thinking about it if he thought about it he wouldn't be able to do it he's just right. in the zone right. and in that zone he's running a program he's he's running a thing he's practiced that he's developed he's written a program algorithms in his mind and he's just doing that without thought and that makes us better at everything. Right, right. Well, that's point awareness that you're talking about in your, in your books. Yes, and now it's an interesting thing, but consciousness, in order to work and be, and be very uh, powerful, needs to be unhampered by worrying over physical process. So if I were to teach, well, that's what I was doing in France, you know, if I would teach people how to heal with their minds, how to get information from databases that are available, how to uh, um, uh, go out of body, how to remote view, all of those things. The first thing I tell them is you have to get your intellect to sit down and be quiet because as much as your intellect's involved, you won't be able to do it. It'll just get in your way. Your, your fear and your ego and your beliefs live in that intellect or they're, they're expressed through that intellect and it will just get in the way. Now, you have to get to what I call a being level, and once you toss the intellect away and you're interacting at the being level, now the being level can think. It's not that the being level can't think, it can think, but its thinking is directive. It's not um, analyzing, comparing, um, uh, what can we say? Uh, it's, it's not making so much assessments as it is just directing what it is you do. It's a directive sort of thing. And you can think at the being level just fine without having the intellect involved. And then you're very powerful. That being level approach can, you know, do these paranormal things. It can remote view very accurately. It can heal. It can do all, it can go out of body if you can get into that being level state. And that's kind of the key thing for remote viewers and you know, healers and whatever else. They have to get in the zone, as you say, and let go of the intellect. So in order to understand that, let me give a, just a real short idea of intellect and being level. And I'll try to make it, uh, uh, maybe, maybe it fits, fits the, the Freudian definition of things like ego too. And that is that the ego, let me define ego as awareness in the service of fear. Okay, ego is awareness in the service of fear. Okay, now you can have awareness in the service of love. Now love is what you're expressing at your being level. Love isn't an intellectual thought. Just like anger isn't an intellectual thought. Nobody thinks, oh, it's time for me to get angry now, so I'll be angry. I mean, nobody thinks that. It's a, it's a, it's a non-intellectual thought. Anger just happens, okay? So anger's down at that being level too. It's just the way you are, okay? But your 
So if you take, if you take uh, awareness, which we might just say is basic uh, prototype or, or uh, whatever of consciousness, we take awareness, fundamental of consciousness, and it's in the service of fear, that tends to, that's our ego. Okay, so that's what our ego is. Now that ego expresses itself through the intellect. It's the intellect says, oh, I don't like that. You know, that was an insult to me. It's the ego. It's the intellect that says it's an insult. And then the anger just pours up out of the being level because the, the intellect has decided that it's been insulted. So that's kind of the way it works. So you can think at the being level, but it's not, a, it's, not a, uh, it's not an ego kind of thinking. It's not a capital I, I. How, how do I compare to that? How is that compared to me? Was that good for me or not good for me? You're not, uh, you're not doing um, analysis about how you, you know, how you, the capital I, fit into this. Or am I doing it right? Am I not doing it right? That's all about I. And all that I stuff is ego stuff. And so that's kind of the way I'm talking about it. This being level is who and what you are at the core of your being. Intellect is who you think you are. That's you acting. That's your image. That's who you believe you are, and it's who you would like to be, but it's not who you really are. So when you are a, a um, uh, living in the moment, when you are um, authentic, now you're at the being level. And that's what the guy is throwing that javelin. He's at the being level. He's not at the intellectual level. He's gotten rid of the intellect, and he's just simply going through the motions he's learned and his training and either that makes him a gold medal or, you know, it doesn't. And there's not much he can do about it right there on the, on the spot other than take uh, illegal drugs, which makes him stronger, but so he then, can't. So then the being level then is, 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 a, is the alignment of body and mind as opposed to intellect? Is that what you're yes, saying? Yes, a good, yeah, a good way to put it. What happens as, um, as we grow up and growing up, in my world means the evolving of your consciousness. And I say that's consciousness quality is getting better. You could say spiritual growth if you were from a, coming from a different spot and it would mean the same thing. So us becoming love, that's growing up, increasing the quality of our consciousness. As we do that, okay, let's say we do that and we get rid of our fear, okay? The f ego and the beliefs are results of fear. So we get rid of our fear. When we get rid of our fear, we don't have a subconscious mind anymore. The subconscious disappears. The subconscious is just that area of us that we stuff things in that we really don't want to deal with. But when we get rid of our fear, we're aware of everything. Now we think at the being level. We interact at the being level. We don't have an image. We just are who we are, okay? We've gotten rid of our fear. So now we live out of the being level and instead of having this this kind of tri-level being of a, of a super ego, an ego, and, a, and an id down in the, you know, in the subconscious, we're just one whole thing. We are just a whole thing. We're aware of everything. We're aware of our instincts. We're aware of our drives. We're aware of, of everything else. And we are living with all of that. You know, it's not, we're not striated into, into sections anymore. So yes, we, at that point, you get rid of the fear you are living right out of your being level. You are authentic as you can be. And without the fear, you are a very low entropy, high quality of consciousness being who cares about other and what can I do to help rather than, you know, what can I get? It's just, that's just the nature of a low entropy consciousness. So yes, that's right. The thinking comes out of the being level eventually. Okay, but right now, most of us are split. We got some ego, we got some fear, we got some beliefs, and we got some stuff at the being level. And it's all this big hodgepodge of stuff. So if we want to heal somebody, we got to get that intellect and that ego and those beliefs to sit down and be quiet so that we can deal with that directly out of the being level. But that being level has anger and has other stuff in it as well, because that is part of us. And that also gets expressed there. So it's, it's this you know, when you learn to do paranormal things like healing and remote viewing and going out of body and that sort of thing, basically, there's nothing to learn. It's not, it's not like you learn this technique and now you can do it. It's not about technique. 
the whole thing, what you have to learn is to let go of all the junk that you've taken on. So it's not about learning something new. It's about getting rid of something old. And if you get rid of all that dysfunctional stuff, all the fear and the ego and the belief, then the paranormal things are just like part of your life. They're not like some special, amazing, magic thing that goes on. It's just part of your life. It's the way you live. The information is just available to you as you need it. So that's, the, that's right. kind of the way that works. I want to go in that direction in a second, but I remember I had two directions I wanted to go a yeah. while back. Well, we circled around to it again anyways through what you were just saying. Awareness, right. awareness in service of love you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to bring back the motorcycle story. Okay. How, how your wife, uh, your, your significant other, um, mm -hmm. is it her fear that, that makes you not ride your motorcycle? I mean, you would see it's love. Okay, it's 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 her love of you, but is mm -hmm. it her love that makes her of you that makes her fear for your life? Right, it's her fear. Basically, it's her fear that does that. But because I care for her, and because her feelings are important to me, of and it doesn't matter that it's her fear. You know, I don't say, oh well, that's just your fear, honey. You need to get over that. You know, you need to get rid of that fear and uh, whatever. Uh, that's not good for you. I'm going to do what I please anyway, because your fear is just dysfunctional. And so I can discount it. And it's not like that at all. Right. Because I care for her, her fear is important to me. Of course. If she feels upset because I ride a motorcycle, if it makes her, you know, worry. And if even if she gets on the back of the, my, the motorcycle with me, and I can feel her fear, and she's clutching on like, you know, to, it's a survival kind of thing for her, then I don't want to do that to her. That's not what I want to do for her because I care about her, then I don't ride the motorcycle. So but, I make a choice to, to right. not do something that I would do otherwise, just because it hurts somebody I care about. Right. So, so I, what I, I, what I, what I want to go through, go into, into this is that awareness in the service of love. So a love based society with fear as its base basis for love, does that not create just that, 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 that wave that you're now you're on the high point of love, but it's really at the core of that high point of love is fear still. And, and it'll you know, go this. No, I don't see that fear as a basis has anything to do with, with, um, it isn't a basis or a foundation for love. No, yes. not, sorry. Let me just clarify before you go any further. Okay. I don't mean in reality. I mean the reality of the, the NPMR world. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, that that the 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 reactive world the, the reactive mm -hmm. love i mean there's you know in in ancient times there was three kinds of love right there was there was more than one kind of love even the bible from what i understand that they just turned it into one kind of love but really they were talking about a different kind of love than what what people interpret it as there's the love of of the world that we have that we all feel from each other mm -hmm. that, that is fear-based that you know when you love somebody you don't want them to go away you fear for their lives if mm -hmm. they're sick no now, when you love somebody and you don't want them to go away, the loving somebody is your love. You care about that person, that you don't want them to go away is your ego. Right. Exactly. I don't want them to go away. You know, it's, it's what I want. Exactly. It's what right. makes me feel good for them to go away. So that's your ego. Right. So if you get rid of that ego, you get rid of your fear and you don't have that ego, then you let things happen the way they happen. It's not that you have to stay because I want you to stay is, you you have free will. You make your own choices, and I'll deal with the results of your choices because I care for you. But I meant so, leave even in death. I don't mean leave just as in you're leaving me. I mean leaving even in death. For instance, right. your, your 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 wife's fear of your your motorcycle and you know, uh -huh. um, your your love of of your thrill, right? I I, I know from reading mm -hmm. your book, right? You you have a you have a you have an affinity for danger and uh, speed and. Uh, and I imagine, like I say, like you say, your your wife has a fear of losing you through through mm -hmm. your own desire for a thrilling existence. I suppose that's the fear I'm, of that's the fear and love mm -hmm. intermingling that I'm referring to. Right. So she has that that fear, and that fear is something that it would be nice that she could get rid of it. She would be happier without that fear. Her life would be better without that fear. And if she didn't have that fear, I may be riding around today on a motorcycle. And that just would be the way it is. So, you know, it's, 
it's not that her fear is a good fear. Her fear is a problem for her. Now, it, it may keep me living longer than I would otherwise, but then that's my free will choice. Right. So if she didn't have fear, then my passing or my dying wouldn't be that big a thing. It would be like, well, okay, it was his choice. He wanted the, you know, that motorcycle was something he really loved. And okay, he got run over by a truck. <sighs> that's the way it is. Now let's go on. You right. see, it wouldn't, if she didn't have the fear, like, oh no, now what am I going to do? How's this going to be for me? How does it change my life? You see, all that is the fear and the ego coming in. So if she didn't have the fear, then it wouldn't be a problem. It's just, uh, so because it's a problem for her, then it becomes a problem for me because her problems become my problems because I care about her. Right. But I make that choice. Yeah. I don't do that with the idea of, well, I really want to ride the motorcycle and she keeps me from doing it. That's not it. You see, that's, that's just ego again. Yeah. If you make that choice, then it's your choice. Own it, you know, live with it, accept it. And that's the way it is. So I very willingly uh, don't ride motorcycles anymore because it uh, affects her in a negative way in a negative way that I don't want to do. It's easier for me not to ride a motorcycle than it is for her to deal with her fear. Right. So the fear doesn't really, isn't the basis for love. The fear is always a basis of a problem. It's a problem for her. If she didn't have the fear, her life would be better. Right. And, and even if I get run over by a truck, her life is still going to be better because she won't deal with that, with that, with my death, with, all of that angst and, and uh, grieving and all the rest of it, it'll just be, well, he, at least he died happy. He was on that motorcycle and doing what he wanted to do. You know, he, he went out in a, you know, in a flash of glory there, enjoying right. himself. That's just the way it is, his choice. And she'd let that go and basically celebrate, you know, the time we had together and go on. That's what you do if you don't have fear. If you have fear, then it's, oh, it's upset my life. It's changed my life in a way I don't want to be changed. So the fear is always a problem. Right. It's never the root of, of love or even loving actions. It just is what it is. Now, you know, I could have, let's say I was a person who had a lot of ego myself. And I said, well, honey, I'm sorry about that, but I'm going to ride the motorcycle. You're just going to need to, you know, deal with it. Mm -hmm. I could say that. Okay. But then now we have two, two problems. We have her problem of fear and my problem of, of arrogance not really giving a damn about her fear, letting her deal with that, you see. So now we've got two things that are dysfunctional going on, you know, dysfunction working against dysfunction, which is the way most relationships are. You know, we've got dysfunction on both sides and that creates all the problems. But you can do it. Sorry, go ahead. Love is something you give and it only takes one to love. Love isn't a, love doesn't have to be earned. Love is just a gift you give away for free. Love is always unconditional. If it's conditional, it's not love. So you give the love and that's it. It's a gift. It doesn't expect anything to come back. It doesn't have any, you know, connections or any, 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 uh, anything that, that needs to happen because of it. it. You just give it away. So in a relationship, you can have a good relationship if just one person loves. That'll work. It's not like for a relationship, both people have to be the same and give the same amount. That's not required. Just one person who, who loves is enough for a relationship. Okay, that's all it takes. But love is not a two-way thing. Now, like, like is a two-way thing. Trust is a two-way thing. You have to earn somebody to like you. But you can love people that you don't like, you know, that's a, that's a possibility, you know, and that has to do with a lot of people and their in-laws. <laughs> you can love people, but you don't like them. And like has to be earned. Trust has to be earned, but love doesn't have to be earned. Love is a giveaway. You just love. So did we, did we go where you wanted to go with that yes. motorcycle thing? Yes. Yes. That's what I wanted to, I wanted to, to explore that because I find that, that oftentimes, that's what I run up against. I run up against, and I was going to say, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily, the, 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 the response doesn't necessarily have to be arrogance to, to say to somebody that, you know, this is something that I must do. And even though no. it goes against your wishes, it doesn't necessarily exactly. have to be a dysfunction. You're right. Absolutely. It may be just something that you have to do. Right. And they just have to live with that because you just have to do that. 
you know, yeah, it may just be that way. And then it's, you know, it's like it or lump it, but you have, they have to deal with it because you make free will choices and everybody else has to deal with them. Right. And, you know, your significant other makes free will choices and you have to deal with them and everybody else in her life has to deal with them. So that's one of the neat things about this, this virtual reality we live in. We've got all these relationships and everybody has free will choice and they do things and we have to deal with it. Well, that having to deal with it makes us make choices, how we deal with it. So let's say uh, my wife says something that she has to do. I have to go out and buy 200 pairs of shoes because I just have to have them. It's just part of my feminine thing and I need those shoes. And you see, I can, I get to choose then how to react to that. And if I react to it, that's stupid. Nobody needs that many shoes. You know, it's a waste of our money. Da, 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 da. You say, well, then that's my choice. I can choose to do that. Or I can, I can say, well, okay, honey, if that's what you need, if it's that important to you, then, you know, go do it. We'll, we'll figure out how to pay for them. But if it's really something you have to go do, you know, a girl's got to do what a girl's got to do, right. go do them and we'll support it. So it gives me choices. So all these people that we interact with give us choices, how to, how we react to it. And by those choices, we evolve or de-evolve the quality of our consciousness. So it's our relationships that's really the, Challenge. that's the place where the rubber meets the road and in, in choices. Right. It's not those people at work. Yeah, rubber meets the road, a little bit of the road there, but it's yep. those, it's those real okay. significant right. relationships. Yeah. Well, that's why I don't want to pick on, pick on Pamela. Here. I don't want to, <laughs> but, but you're right. I, I agree that, 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 you know, it's face-to-face -face stuff where you really see the fine, you can really fine tune things. And right. so I, want, I just want to delve into this a little bit more. A, an, indi you're, an individuated person has free will, you're saying. Does an unindividuated person, in other words, a fear-based person, do they really have free will? Sure, they have free will. They don't have to respond to that fear. They okay. can get rid of that fear. Okay, so they let's... Don't Let's stop right there. I just want to follow yeah. a train of thought, if you don't mind. I don't want to. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. So in, 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 in your significant other's case, um, mm -hmm. would you say she's devolving by, by allowing that fear of, of your motorcycle escapades dictating her, her direction? Is that devolving? Is there only devolving or evolving? Um, in general, yes, there's only devolving and evolving. But, you know, it's not, it's not that each, it's you devolve or evolve as a, as a whole, as a whole consciousness, as a whole individuated units of consciousness. So if the only choice that she ever made in her life was to be fearful of my motorcycle riding, then that would de-evolve her. But the fact that she's also making thousands of other choices, many of which are on the, you know, on the love side, on the, on the giving side, on the caring side. So in, whole, in all in all, She's evolving. She's not de-evolving. But yes, she's got some components that are not helping her, you know, in, in her progress. And it's her thing to do here in this lifetime is to work on those, is to figure out that, uh, you know, well, this is me. This is my ego. It's what I want. And I'm imposing what I want on somebody else. I want somebody else to change their behavior because of what I want. I want them to, to uh, kind of to take something out of their free will choices because, you know, that's what I want them to do. Well, that's the way it is. And, you know, I don't expect other people that I meet to be perfect. Hopefully they don't expect me to be perfect either. You know, so we have to realize that a whole person may be evolving, but they may have some sides of them and some pieces and things that they do that aren't really helping that evolution that are kind of a drag on it, but they've got enough stuff going on the positive side that they're still getting better. And the thing is, as they keep getting better, it'll get easier and easier for them to deal with those things that are still left over. So it's just, you know, it makes it easier. So eventually it'll be easy for her not to have that fear for her to just live a life that's, that um, lets other other people's free wills be as free as possible. Right. Because, you know, I find that, that, that there's, there's, there's a lot of camps these days or a lot of um, directions people are going to the extreme because it's an extreme time. And the, the love extreme is a, is a big one nowadays, too. The love, light and love world. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and and uh, from what I see, because I, from what I've noticed, it seems to me that there is a lot of fear-based love out there. That there's a lot of, um, um, it's it, a lot of love is hidden in the fear base. You know what? Maybe we won't. We don't need to go in this direction. Yeah, I think give, me, give me an example. Give me an example. An example is Trump. Mm -hmm. What Trump does to people and what the environment, the the the, the conditions of the environment, um, that people who 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 promote a lot of love and and light, um, are very quick to have judgment of of people whose actions seem to go against what they consider to be love and light. For instance, uh, I'll just go a little bit further. You were saying that earlier in our conversation that it's the extremity of of the people of the of the energies that are holding fast to hierarchy and to power mm -hmm. uh, is actually energetically giving the impetus to the contrast of that. So if you look at everything dispassionately and, and objectively, it's just forces. But when you attach attachments to those forces of love or hate or good or bad, mm -hmm. then you're, you're doing something else to those forces that turn it, turn it into Right. A part in a story as opposed to a force in the universe. Right. What you're doing is you attach your ego to it. You attach your beliefs to it. Right. And you attach your ego to it. And when your ego which means you're attaching your fear to it. And when you do, then you're right and they're wrong. And they need to change to do it the way you know is right. right. You say, which is arrogant in a in in many many senses you know i'm right you're wrong you need to change and do it my way because the other person feels the same way they feel that you're wrong and that they're right and you need to do it their way and that's just not helpful in the in the world of growing up you see it's not a helpful thing so yes you have ego just because it's ego and it's making choices for itself doesn't mean that all of its choices have to be evil or bad it just says that it's what's motivating it is ego so, you know, I want my kids to grow up and be, you know, professionals with a good quality of life and, you know, a close family. You know, that's what I want for my kids, right? Well, that's ego. It's what I want for my kids, okay? Now, if I take that, that I want and I try to enforce it on my kids, no, I don't want you to go to art school. No, I don't want you to, you know, do this or do that. You need to be an engineer, you know, you need to do this. You need to be a doctor, a lawyer, an Indian chief. You need to be, you know, in, in that strata and so on. If I impose that on them, then that's a problem. You see, that's not good for them because I'm taking their free will away. But now if I offer that to them as a choice and I say, well, look, here's the reality of economics. Here's all the various things you can do. And if you want to become an artist, you got about one chance in a hundred thousand that you'll make it big and, and uh, you know, live a really very nice life. You probably have about a 95% chance that you won't be able to make ends meet and you'll have to wait tables in order to put food on the table uh, or feed your children. You see, and that's just life of our economic system right now. So I could lay that out as choices and then respect whatever choice they make and support whatever choice they make. So I can, I can offer suggestions, I can point out issues, but I can't, or I shouldn't say I can't, I shouldn't try to manipulate the free will. Right. Well, if you go to art school, I'm not paying for it. You know, you pay your own way to college if you're going to do that. So now I'm trying to manipulate their free will. And if they're over 18, that's not a good thing. You know, if they're only six, it's still a good thing. No, you can't go out and play in traffic. I'm going to put a lock on the gate. You know, well, that's okay. They're young. But once they're old enough, you have to let them make their own free will choices and then support them. Once they are, well, then you support it. Pay for them to go to art school if that's what they want and encourage them, tell them what great artists they are and, uh, you know, just make it as positive as you can. It's their choice. Your choice, their choice gives you a choice. How are you going to deal with it? Right. And your choice is to support it, then that's a good choice and you'll grow up. Right. If your choice is to fight it, that's a bad choice coming out of your ego. So it's not that ego is always wrong. I want them to grow up and be happy and fruitful and multiply and have a good life and be able to pay their bills. 
yeah, well, that's my idea. Somebody else maybe doesn't feel like that, and that's okay. I have to let them be. But it's a nice sentiment, even if it's just ego. You see, so all ego is an evil. It's just the way you are. It's you. You just have to be careful that the way you are doesn't demand of other people that they be the way you are or that they think the way you think. So you respect everybody else's free will choice too, even if you don't like it. Even well, if you even if you think it's dysfunctional, you have to respect it. Now, you education, yes. Um, yeah, you want to stand on a street corner with a picket saying this is a stupid idea. You know that's okay. That's education. You know you can you can man the ramparts. You know if you wish, but you do that in a sense of in, uh, education, not a sense of trying to force somebody to your will. That's not a good thing to do with your ego. All that does is perpetuate the power struggle. It doesn't, it doesn't solve it. But that also includes our thoughts, doesn't it? It's not just what we, what we speak with our words. Because our, our thoughts, uh, it doesn't, I'll, I'll go back to some of the information I've gotten from your, from your information. Double slit experiment, to me, is a big, is a big, very interesting, it implies a lot of interesting things. On yes, it does. And one thing that it implies is that you don't have to speak anything. You don't have to, in your mind, you can say you're making a terrible mistake, but your words are saying, I support you. So it has to be, in, it has to be your thoughts that agree with your words, doesn't it? To, I mean, yes. Absolutely. You know, that's this difference between your intellect and your being level. You know, you, as long as you have this war going on between your intellect and your being level, you're going to be an unhappy person probably with ulcers. You know, you're going to have a lot of stress in your life and, uh, you know, you'll just, you know, you won't be a happy, a happy person. So you need to get all that together to where your, your, uh, you know, what you say is also coming from love, not coming from ego. And what you are is coming from love. You get all that in one spot and then it's okay. But yes, many people are conflicted. They say one thing and they mean another. They think one thing, but they say another. Well, that, that saying that's, is a is an image it's they're saying what they think they should say they're trying to be a good person you know okay i want to tell my kids don't go to art school you know i really want to tell them that but i know that's not so good so i'm going to say okay sweetie if that's what you want to do you know go ahead and do that but you know why don't you get your degree in engineering first and then if you still want to go to art school go to art school you know well that's you trying to be a better person but you're not really there yet and it's not about acting, it's about being. At the being level, you have to, you know, it's different. That's the authentic you. It's not the you trying to be a good person and not run over somebody's free will, but that's really not what you want to do. You really like to reach out there and, and adjust their life for them, give them the right attitude, which of course is a reflection of your attitude. <laughs>